And for more now and the insight on the Ukraine crisis, we're joined by Ivan Elin from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and he is a senior fellow and director at the Independent Institute Center of Peace and Liberty. Welcome back to our broadcast. Thank you for having me back. Ivan, as you know, today, Ukraine celebrating 23 years of independence. We saw two very different parades going on. Um, does the parade by the separatists help their cause in any way uh, ahead of the meetings on Tuesday where we're expecting uh, President Putin and Poroshenko to meet? Um, will this hurt their cause going into this or help it? Yeah, I think it will hurt it, actually, because this is against the Geneva Convention. But, of course, neither side in the Civil War has really followed uh, the Geneva Convention because the Ukrainian government is civ shelling civilian areas. So there's been a lot of civilians killed. So it's a, it's a brutal conflict. It's a small conflict, but it's brutal. And uh, I don't think the parading prisoners, uh, no matter which side does it, is a good idea. What can we expect to come out of the talks on Tuesday with Presidents Putin and Poroshenko? Already, German uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel has said that you know, she's been there since Saturday and she doesn't expect much. Well, I, I would agree, but I think the German proposal is actually very good. They need to have federalism, meaning uh, give this region some autonomy and uh, uh, from the main Ukrainian government so that people don't feel oppressed. I mean, there is some uh, legitimate self-determination here, but I think, it need, you know, obviously Ukraine probably shouldn't break apart, but I think you can give the people some autonomy, and that might be the solution. I think that is the solution. The problem is it's sort of like uh, uh, Palestine to some extent. Everybody knows what the solution is. It's just getting the people to do it. That's the problem. And I think uh, uh, this is less so than Palestine, but I think, you know, you're seeing the same problem. What you need is uh, really a decentralization of this region so that it's, in the, you know, not independent but autonomous from uh, the Kiev government. President Poroshenko announced, as you know, about $3 billion would be spent on re-equipping the army, and army there in 2015 and 2017. Ukraine's armed forces are only a fraction of the size of those of Russia. You know, how hard is it going to be for them to keep it together? Well, I think, you know, uh, the, all small countries surrounded by the big country, uh, the big country can invade at will. But the, the idea is to have a, like a porcupine strategy where the, the big guy has to say, well, if I do that, it's going to cost me more than, you know, it would today because the Ukrainian military isn't very good now. But if it got better and they spent some money on it, uh, the Russians might think twice about uh, invading. And, of course, that is an ever-present danger at this point. As you know, President Putin has strongly denied arming the rebels, but NATO says it has proof. What proof is there at this point, and do we expect something to come out of the meetings on Tuesday regarding this? Well, I think there's a lot of suspicion that that's the case, but I think the U.S. has probably been uh, aiding the Ukrainian military under the table as well. So uh, they, they, there have been reports by, by NATO of Russian shelling across the border, uh, on Ukrainian forces, and also uh, this they, this latest convoy, they suspected that there were arms and um, uh, supplies going to the rebels. But I, I don't think NATO has really offered conclusive proof of that yet. So uh, we'll we'll have to see if they offer more in the future. Can Russia withstand even deeper sanctions that are that are in place now? Oh, I think they probably can. It'll just cost them, and I think uh, that that's about all you can do with sanctions. Is you know, uh, put the squeeze on them and see if they if that will be at the margin be enough. But in, in cases like this, you have to economic sanctions uh, when big issues of security are, are at stake. Countries oftentimes are willing to withstand a lot of economic pressure. Remember, Saddam Hussein had worldwide comprehensive sanctions against him, and he refused to get out of Kuwait, which which wasn't as big as this. Ukraine is very important to Russia. And uh, uh, not only because it's of its economy, but because it's a strategic buffer. And the Russians, of course, you know, had 25 million dead in, in uh, World War II. So they're, they're very conscious of policing their near abroad, uh, their sphere of influence, that is, to uh, make sure that they're friendly governments. And, of course, Russia is really uh, going from a position of weakness because it lost the Ukraine government. And now there's an unfriendly government in Kiev. So it's trying to salvage... Uh, Crimea and the eastern part, uh, what it can of its uh, buffer zone there. Ivan Elin, live in Fort Lauderdale, thank you for your time and your insight.